to my dear Prince Alexis. I did not usurp the crown. I found it in the gutter. And I, I picked it up with my sword. And it was the people, Alexis. The people who put it on my head. He who saves a nation violates no law. On the 2nd of December, 1804, Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself Emperor of the French in a grand ceremony in Notre Dame, putting an end to the days of the Revolutionary Republic and ushering in the First French Empire. This decision to crown himself is often cited as evidence for his being an egomaniac. After all, what better way to stroke your own ego than crown yourself emperor, effectively posing a direct challenge to the Holy Roman Empire that had stood for centuries. But it's not only the transition from first consul to emperor, but also the physical act of placing the crown on his own head, rather than having the Pope do it for him, that really cements this image of Napoleon being a petty, self-absorbed man. However, such an explanation is rather lazy and convenient oversimplification, circumventing the actual motives and concerns that drove the actions of Napoleon and those surrounding him on the eve of this great transition. I'm the Enlightened Edelweiss, and in this video, we'll be answering the question of why Napoleon crowned himself emperor. <laughs> In order to properly evaluate this seemingly bizarre turn of events, we must start in the early months of 1804, with the failure of a royalist plot to kill Napoleon and restore the Bourbon pretender Louis XVIII to the throne. In the relentless search for the conspirators that followed, the Duc d'Angion, a direct descendant of Louis XIII who had fled the revolution earlier, was implicated. Evidence to suggest the Duke's participation was rather flimsy and circumstantial. Yet Talleyrand and Fouché managed to convince Napoleon that the air is full of daggers, and that the Duke had masterminded the plot. The next day, at a meeting at the Tuileries, Napoleon agreed to a plan to kidnap the Duke, who now lived in the town of Ettenheim, less than 15 kilometers from the French border. The plan was carried out on the 15th of March. On the 19th of March, however, Napoleon received word that there was no evidence to suggest the Duke had any involvement with the plot. It was, however, found that he had contacts with the British Secret Service and had promised to start a royalist coup in Alsace in the event of Napoleon's assassination. So, while it was clear that he had no involvement in the plot at hand, it was also clear that he was not wholly innocent either. Napoleon wished to use this as grounds to execute him. The Duke had openly admitted to being in the pay of England and having borne arms against France, providing a legal basis for his execution. Napoleon wanted to use the opportunity to send a message, using the Duke as an example so as to warn against any further plots on his life. It would also put to rest any hope of a reconciliation between him and the Bourbons. He was executed on the 2nd of August, 1804. Following the conclusion of the Messi affair, a key weakness of the current French regime became clear to Napoleon and those around him. It was now evident that the stability and survival of the regime would be severely compromised in the event of a successful plot on Napoleon's life. A few days following the Duc d'Angers' execution, the Senate, egged on by Fouché, suggested that quote-unquote other institutions may be needed to safeguard the revolution and discourage further plots. In a meeting of the Conseil d'État on the 28th of March, the possibility of a hereditary system was discussed, and Napoleon, evidently convinced, stated that 
The hereditary principle alone could prevent a counter-revolution. The reasoning behind this was that power would not be bound to one man, making it so that if Napoleon was ever assassinated, the regime would not be left without an obvious successor. However, some historians have pointed out a perceived flaw in this argument. That being that Napoleon had no legitimate children at the time that could inherit the throne. This does place a degree of ambiguity over his motives. Though it must be kept in mind that, even without children, a line of succession could easily be constructed, as was quickly done in this case, with his older brother Joseph declared his successor, followed by his younger brother Louis. That being said, the stability of France wasn't the only factor that prompted Napoleon to take on his new title. Part of it also stemmed from a desire to be able to address his contemporaries such as Tsar Alexander of Russia and Emperor Francis of Austria from an equal plane. Additionally, he also said to General Soult that crowning himself emperor would put an end to any hope of a Bourbon restoration. Though this was certainly not a major factor at play, seeing as this end had already been sufficiently accomplished through the execution of the Duc d'Argent. It was deemed that Emperor was a suitable title since it made the paramount distinction between Napoleon and the Bourbon kings of the old order. Furthermore, the word Empire was already in use when talking of French conquests abroad, and thereby it did not contradict the existence of a republic. Indeed, France continued to call itself a republic long after the coronation of Napoleon and it was only officially changed to empire in the year 1809. Overall, it was the need for stability, the wish to be on equal terms with his imperial contemporaries, and perhaps to some extent to rule out the possibility of a reconciliation with the Bourbons, that Napoleon adopted the title Emperor of the French in 1804. Coming to the actual physical act of placing the crown on his head, this is often misunderstood and touted as an almost spur-of-the-moment ego trip by Napoleon, when in actuality, it was a highly calculated decision, meant to send a message about the nature of the regime. Napoleon crowning himself rather than the Pope was primarily a gesture to the more radical revolutionaries that didn't approve of his reconciliation with the Catholic Church. It would signify that he was not about to simply bow down and be controlled by the Church in Rome, and preserved the secular nature of the revolution, setting it apart from the coronations of the monarchs that came before. It also sent a striking message, emphasizing the Enlightenment ideal of the self-made man. Napoleon wanted to imply that he was not made emperor by any divine right, but through his own merit and the will of the people. The Pope, of course, knew about this decision beforehand and was therefore not expecting to place the crown on Napoleon's head in the first place. In fact, it is likely that Napoleon was aware of the egotistical implications that such a gesture could give rise to and regretted placing the crown on his head. When the famous painter Jacques-Louis David wished to paint the moment of Napoleon's crowning, he was instead ordered to paint Napoleon's crowning of Josephine. All in all, we can see that Napoleon and those around him had various practical and political considerations behind their decisions. Simply reducing his crowning to an act of hubris and egomania is a remarkably unsatisfactory conclusion that fails completely in its explanation of the events that took place. Well folks, that's the end of the video. Thanks for watching, I hope you found it useful, and I'll see you in the next one.